Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty, and I'm welcoming back today to the show someone who hasn't been on since I looked it up, episode 126 which was in October of 2021 to talk about this very game, which is finally out, uh, The Light in the Darkness. Luke Bernard, welcome back to the show, my friend. How are you? Uh, hi, I'm doing good. I'm glad to hear it. I, uh, I played your game, The Light in the Darkness, yesterday from when we were recording, and uh, I was really impressed by it. I thought it was really interesting. I have, people know because I, I'm a copious note taker, but I think I have like more notes for this one hour game than than I do for when we do, Hor- when we do Horizon um, so or something like 50 hours. So there's so many things to talk about. People know that I love history. I, I ma- majored in American history and was going to grad school when I ended up doing this instead. So um, things like this speak to me in a very meaningful way. And um, yeah, I have so many questions about it. So first of all, congratulations on the launch. And Thank you. how are you? What, tell me a little bit about what's going on with you recently. Uh, well, things have been really good actually since the launch. So... Basically, since the launch, I've been like, I'm under NDA, but I've been like advising Holocaust museums. I have like pretty much for this full, I'm in back to back anti hate conferences. I am. So, since the launch, it's kind of gone crazy, it has, because even the mainstream press is not something which I would have expected. We haven't really gotten much gaming press. We haven't, but it's all gone mainstream. Economist, Guardian, just every nearly every single mainstream outlet especially in england and then an, another surprising thing is that it became kind of a hit in saudi arabia which has oh. no holocaust education whatsoever so it's been quite fascinating to, to see the launch interesting we've been very critical of them on the show recently so it's cool to have something more positive to say um, about about the saudi gaming scene um, yeah, yeah, but, but because I, I'm very much like, how can I say? It? I, I just I treat your civilians as country as civilians, pretty much. Mm-hmm. I do just just because, let's say, in the case of Saudi Arabia, it's not really a democracy at all. <laughs> it isn't. So that's kind of how I view things. So, for example, we couldn't launch it in Russia because you know sanctions or things like that, which I thought. Bit of a shame, uh, mm. but pretty much because also the program on the title is Russian. He is, but he's um, he's not in Russia anymore uh, for obvious reasons. Right. So that's also been interesting to kind of navigate to. I mean, the the team has also been um, the team on the game is actually pretty diverse. It is it's pretty much Indian, Native American, Asian, Latino, like it's a Russian refugee, like it's people kind of from all over the world too. So that's also been quite an interesting thing which I'll get into later because we didn't qualify for any diversity funds. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. Yet we had actually, I would argue, one of the most diverse teams in America. But that's something I'll get into later, why we didn't. But yeah, the launch has actually been uh, fantastic, it has. Awesome. So it's called again, and people will see in the title too, The, Law, the Light in the Darkness, it's free. Um, it's about an hour long or so. I, play, yeah. I It took me about an hour and 35 minutes, but I was typing notes. So I assume that that had a lot to do with the, the extra time. And uh, it tells the story of a, a French Jewish family, really Polish immigrants. Yeah. And I guess their native born son um, and their their experience in pre World War II France briefly, then obviously the invasion, Vichy France, and all the way to nineteen forty two. And it's a it's a brisk game. And I was wondering how you would tell the story like how the story would come off in such a brisk setting, but it really emotionally worked for me. I gotta be honest with you. It really it throws a few curves in there and it tells you kind of what you need to know about this little fraction of the Holocaust story in World War II. And this is what I wanted to ask you. First of all, people should go back, Luke, and listen to our episode 126. If you guys want to hear a little bit more about anti-Semitism in the gaming industry, kind of the Jewish experience and modernity and all of that, that's there. And we can get a little bit into that here. But in focusing specifically on the game, I wanted to ask you to start, what made you want to focus on what was essentially a story in France and Vichy France? Uh, a part of 
um, World War II history, at least from an American point of view, that we actually don't learn too much about because France doesn't enter the American story for World War II until 1944. Yeah. Um, and so people have to dig a little deeper to understand what's going on here. And I, I, my feeling, Luke, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that I feel like you wanted to put a spotlight on collaborationism um, and on the different gradients of the way people collaborated or tried to resist the people that were your friend, you thought you were friend, they were uh, friendly to you, but stab you in the back and all of that. I don't know if I'm accurate there, but talk to me a little bit about well, what, yeah, talk to me. So, so f- first off, I'm I'm French, even if I sound British. So there was that. Your name suggests that, yeah. Yeah. As well. <laughs> so there was that, but also France. A bit of history, right? With France, Napoleon emancipated the Jews. He was basically like, "I become emperor now. You guys are equal French citizens. You're equal. You no longer have to be in the ghettos, and you no longer have to do all the shit jobs. You're equal." So Napoleon emancipated the Jews, and since then. Jews had had equal rights in France. They were better off than the rest of Europe. Then in the 1800s, when France colonized uh, Algeria, to the Sephardic Jews, they were like, here you go, citizenship. They they were giving all citizenship to Sephardic Jews. They wanted more Sephardic Jews in France because they they thought they were kind of, quote unquote, model citizens. Hmm. And Sephardic Jews within 10 years basically became like, Super French. Uh, they did the uh, Jews of Algeria. So they started learning French, became super French. And so France had a fantastic history uh, with Jews, they do. Yes, there was the Dreyfus Affair, pretty much, but that tore society apart, it did. So, yes, anti Semitism was still there, but it wasn't like Poland or like other places. And so during World War II, even when kind of before the Holocaust, a lot of Polish Jews were immigrating to France because they were like, this is the place where we'll be safe. This is the place where it's equal rights. And even also during the Holocaust, too, there was a lot of people trying to make it to France. But then France, within a matter of years, pretty much went towards committing a genocide. <laughs> they did. It went from the best country for Jews, which no one thought it would literally happen, to France committing a genocide. And even when they rounded up, uh, during the Valdiv Roundup, round up, the Nazis actually didn't ask for children, but the French were like, yeah, yeah, just send off the children too. So I thought that period was very interesting for people to know how quick a government can turn genocidal and against its own people. And also it's an aspect of the Holocaust which isn't much uh, mentioned. Like, funny enough, even the mum... American Holocaust educators like had to debate at times with some where they were like, there was no camps in France. And I was like, yeah, there was a PTVA camp. There was so many camps. They weren't death camps, but they were transit camps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were before they sent people off to Auschwitz or other places. And so that, there's kind of moment in history which many people don't know about. And again, also in the case of France, you know, it was – a French government that was in power, pretty much, no matter if, if it was uh, illegitimate or not, it was still a French government. So I thought it was important for people to know that, and most importantly also for people to know how quick a government can turn was in the matter of years. So I thought that aspect was also very interesting. And again, it's not as talked about as the rest of Europe because it, it was around 75,000 Jews who got killed. France had this, one of the highest survival rates. Mm-hmm. It did. But that's also because most Jews have managed to make it to the Zone Libre they had, which still, you know, years later still had a lot of Nazi presence. So that's why I thought it was an interesting uh, story to also tell. And it's a story which, you know, not many people kind of know enough uh, in terms of the Holocaust. It's mostly focused on, uh, you know, Eastern Europe often. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, the death count is so staggering that you, your eyes are drawn there. But it's really at the sake of understanding the full context of the story and everyone that suffered, which I thought was a really key part of this. Now, my history on this is a little fuzzy, so you're going to have to fill me in. But France during World War II was not fully occupied by the Nazis, right? That was where Vichy France yeah. came from, right? Like they didn't have the manpower because of Barbarossa to leave an occupying force in all of France, which is where the collaboration comes from, right? And there is some controversy around did Vichy France or at least this is what I remember. You can fill me in, but like obviously Vichy France were collaborationists and, the, and, but that they remained kind of muddled and some people looked at them as keeping France French, right? 
during during the German occupation. So there is some complicated there is some complications from that time. I'm curious to know what you think of that. There's a lot of debate that happens in France, and it's mostly kind of with the far right. It is mm-hmm. where where the far right is pretty much no, it wasn't France. It was Vichy France kind of thing, and the normal right. Uh, and conservative and uh, conservatives and centrists are like, no, no, it was France because actually it's not in the far right; it's also the far left. That also, like, it wasn't France, but Vichy France still still did it. It was still Pétain. They still did all those things. <laughs> they did again. France was quite divided during those times. It was so. I, I would say, from my point of view, because even Chirac, pretty much in the nineties, said yes, France did do the Holocaust. I do consider that France did do the Holocaust. Yeah. They, they, they did. Yes, it was kind of complicated because there's a lot of people that defend. They'd be like, no, they wanted to keep uh, France French. They're trying to help people because first they sent off the Polish Jews they did, which right. takes place in the game, right. which is still incredibly fucked up because these people, you know, were, were legal in France. <laughs> they were pretty much. So they first sent out to Polish Jews thinking, okay, maybe if we give them the Polish Jews, it might be okay. But then, Again, with the relative roundup, they did more than what Nazi Germany asked, pretty much with rounding up the children too. But France was also incredibly divided, which makes it very interesting. I mean, that's why you had the French resistance. That's why you, if you were a Jew, right, a lot of the time, if you made it over to the countryside, you could find refuge. You could, because even within France, anti-Semitism was stemming a lot from kind of the elites, rich people, um, you know, kind of people, people in power pretty much, while the working class, peasants, which basically are farmers, that's what we call them. It's not like a negative term. Mm. They were always helping out pretty much. That's why even the French resistance was very much working class, all those things. So you had really a country which was quite torn apart by this. It wasn't so black and white to say Nazi Germany or Poland. Because again, the French resistance was pretty big. It it was pretty much fighting against this. That's why it is quite a complicated uh, history. But I I still stand by France did do this, even Mm. if you did have a lot of um, good French people. Like, Like, say, for example, one of the characters, Marie, who at one point she's kind of like, you know, France will win, uh, fuck the bush. Not exactly that, but, you know, piss mm. off the bush, which is kind of a slang term for German. Her backstory, which is not in the game, pretty much she lost her first husband during World War One. So there's a lot of anti-German sentiment within France, which also kind of helped, you know, with recruiting people to the to resistance and things like that. So that's what's interesting with the game, actually. Each character does have a lot of backstory, which isn't necessarily in the game, but it was kind of made to why they're there and why they have their certain actions and feelings. And we we can even notice within the characters, since you'll notice the characters that kind of wear suits, which are more, quote unquote, upper class, richer, they're the ones that turn anti-Semitic quick and faster, which is what was happening in France. While my working class, like Marie pretty much, are kind of like, what the hell is going on? So that's what, again, was interesting in France. So talk to me a little bit about, God, there, I have so many things with my notes here. You open up with, the game opens with a July 6, 1938 date, and it talks about an international conference that FDR proposes, President of the United States at the time, um, that a bunch of countries kind of come together and f- say, like, what can we do for Jewish refugees? I And that the answer is that nothing. And obviously the United States really didn't do its, you know, play a a role in allowing refugees in famously turn ships aside and back and whatever. Um, Why did you want to open with that? Was that to to show that people knew at this time that something was happening? Because there is a lot of you'll know this better than anyone having studied this so deeply. It's like the revision about when people knew in positions of power what was happening to European Jews is far deeper than I think ever let on and that people made active decisions not to help. And I'm wondering well, if that was part of the so, intention. So part of my intention also really is, is so it, it happens later on in the story, is that countries closed their borders. They did. And so to me, when a, a lot gets presented in um, Hollywood, kind of things like that, it's always very much, you know, 
black and white. America came over, saved everyone. And again, I'm, I'm super grateful for the army and all the soldiers that came over and sacrificed their lives. But I, I do believe it could have been a preventable thing because we knew what was happening. We mm. did. We knew it was really bad. People were trying to make it out. They were all costs like, everywhere. Like, even the British, when they had the British mandate of Palestine, pretty much closing the borders when people people were just trying to make it anywhere. When I look at look at the story of multiple people that died, they're trying to make it anywhere, anywhere they could. And they just couldn't. So e- even with the UK, it's only accepted like 10,000 children in the kinder transport. They keep on bragging about that in England. And I'm kind of like, yeah, you only accepted 10,000 kids. You left all the other ones to die. And even within the kinder transport thing, they're very particular. Like they, they wanted more kids that looked more Anglo-Saxon. Like oh, if, a ki- if a kid kind of looked a bit too Jewish, they kind of like they would pick more the Anglo-Saxon looking kids. So there was a lot of racism still happening there was. So I felt it was kind of important because I didn't want to just present a black and white story, but actually show really, in my opinion, the failure of the world on this pretty much too. So that's why I did. I started off with that because again, being historically accurate and kind of showing the, the bigger picture of it all. And e- even if I don't kind of push it in, you know, I'm not like, writing myself being like well america didn't do this uh, you know country didn't do this i just show what happened yeah. pretty much people can look it up and then you can form your own opinions pretty much based on it after yeah for me i i first of all i agree we could have and should have done more it's complicated because what's so interesting about fdr getting this together in 1938 is he's in the middle of his second term at this point and wildly popular and gets reelected two more times which to me indicates that this this question of European Jewry or whatever, and what would happen to the survivors or not of this clear genocide was a choice. Um, That's why I always say from my perspective, not to get too political, but like the American war machine should be held in reserve for situations of genocide or situations like this, you know, and for nothing else really. Um, So it's, I think it's a, it's a stain on a lot of Western countries, especially that that we didn't do more. It's especially interesting because after the Holocaust, um, a lot of American politicians thought Jews were kind of communists and things like that. So they're like, we don't want those mm-hmm. communists over in, in America. But that's effective so, propaganda, propaganda, right, of of tying Jews to Bolshevism, right? It's not necessarily – like that's, yeah. that shows that it was effective. It worked, I guess. Oh, no, I know. It, it, it worked um, – mm-hmm. it worked across – I mean, that, that's why even when there's a scene where at the end – I talk a bit about the protocols of the elders of Zion mm-hmm. and I kind of go into it where I'm like, yeah, Henry Ford pushed this <laughs> pretty much just to kind of show the international scale of this um, thing pretty much, even because Henry Ford, I mean, is pretty much a, to me a dickhead. <laughs> lo, lo, no, long, totally. It's, long we, we must have talked about this on our last conversation, but I don't remember. I'm so I'm, I smoke too much weed to remember anything, but, <laughs> um, but my in in 11th grade i took a holocaust class and i was it was during the late 90s and and you know so the internet's kind of new and exciting and i ended up getting a bunch of dearborn local newspapers for my teacher at that time that talked about a lot of this stuff in kind of contemporaneous terms about henry ford's complicity i want to talk more about the protocols of the elders design in a little while um mm-hmm. for sure i'm trying to go just to keep myself straight i'm trying to go in the order of my notes which is in the order of the game yeah yeah that's the problem with me i might sometimes veer off into no, it's all good, the scenes my... like <laughs> it's all good, on. don't even worry about it one thing i wanted to i want to talk about mr groshan at some point but we'll talk about him when he turns uh because i think that we can we can just keep it together but one thing i wanted to ask you about i had never heard about this this actually encouraged me to go read about this the jew among thorns i had never heard of this story uh a brother's grim story you know how you feel like you're kind of going through the world and you feel like you know what you need to know not very little surprises you and you're like and and, and they were going over this and i'm like what the fuck are you talking about i went (laughs) on my computer and and looked it up and opened a few new tabs for people that don't know this is a brothers Grimm's fairy tale first published in 1815 although a retelling i guess of a story that had existed in some sort of yeah um yeah some sort of you know tradition for several centuries and it's about ultimately, I guess, a Jew being executed for stealing money, but it has a weird provenance. And I like this scene because it spurs a disagreement with the parents about the truth of anti-Semitism and whether it should be hidden from their kid or not. And I feel like this is another central point of the game from my perspective is 
are the choices. There are choices to be made. What's so fucked up about the game is that none of them matter. Yeah. You know, and so I, I think that that's part of the point, too. But what is the what did you want to bring to the attention of the Jew among thorns? I thought this was fascinating. I had never, ever heard of this uh, in my life. So pretty much the, the original plan was I had taken because there's like in that scene, like right after he gives him this book about uh, the Roman de Renal, which is about Fox pretty much. It's and like, is that named after Renault Paul, Paul or whatever, the guy that refused to sign the armistice or something? No, no, no. It's just this Fox pretty much. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you named it after because I it didn't Philip, Philip, Philippe Paton took over for someone named Renault Paul or something, I thought. And, no, it's, it's, uh, a, it's, it's a very common like French fairy tale. Okay, okay, also okay. In, in other things. And Sorry to interrupt. Basically, in um, I think it was in in Dutch somewhere somewhere I went one Holland or something, mm-hmm. where they had rewritten this normal fairy tale and they kind of made it anti-Semitic and everything. So that was the original plan. But then, pretty much, when I had some advisors, historians, they were like, "Hmm, if you put that in, we don't know if it necessarily was in France during that those times." Mm-hmm. So instead, I went and found another anti-Semitic fairy tale which ended up being the Grimm's Brothers one, because I kind of wanted to show like how uh, in Europe anti-Semitry is so normal it was. It, like, it didn't pop out of nowhere. It didn't. So that's why the fairy tale, it was just there. It was pretty much throughout Europe for like hundreds of years. So that's really why I just put it in there to kind of show that how commonplace it was. And also it brought us, you know, for him kind of giving the book about that fox which is a non-anti-semitic fairy tale so what did you i wonder what would you have what choice would you have made if you if you were um, moses and bluma and moses is more like you know we have to instruct him on the realities of life as a jew in europe right now and kind of this historical anti-semitism that's bubbling and bluma's like he's just a kid and is not ready to hear these things. And again, the choice doesn't ultimately matter, but I wonder what choice you would have made. Cause I, to me, it seems obvious that, that in that time, Moses is right, that you, you definitely should instruct your kid. It seems like a dangerous situation. Well, so that's what, again, was complicated in France is that, that Jewish kids, they were going to make schools, everything, everything was kind of okay among like the, for the most part, pretty much. So, you know, Pass and me would have, if because Moses also too, you know, he thinks everything's going to be fine because it's France. So I might have gone more with Bloomer and been like, no, I think things are going to be fine. If if I was in that period mm. and not knowing the Holocaust had happened, but when you know the Holocaust has happened, I mean, most Jewish kids learn. <laughs> it's one of the first things they kind of learn about. You know, it's kind of like, hey, you want to learn about how we all got murdered, pretty much. <laughs> but that's also a lot of kind of Jewish history. <laughs> it right. is. We everyone tried murdering us, but we lived. So it's kind of. Um, so I think nowadays, yes, I would have told the kid. Back then, I think I wouldn't have thought it would have been possible. I would have, I honestly wouldn't have, if I well, was in France in those times. You, I'm glad you speak to this, Luke, because the next scene or a, a scene kind of after that is September 1st, 1939, famous date in world history. Nazi Germany blitzes Poland, takes it very rapidly. We actually, earlier in the game, have a letter from, I guess, Bluma's. Parents. Polish, yeah, parents, right. And they're kind of on the run. We get multiple updates from them. But something you say to say here about kind of not, we have hindsight, but they think that they're in kind of a safer situation. And I think that this scene does a good job of saying that because the neighbors are huddling around the radio in the Abram- Abramovich's apartment and they are listening or whatever, and they seem confident. And I think one yeah. of the things you know, even I think Bernard says Viva la France and all of that is that their experience is only at this point, 1938. So literally only 20 years ago, um, they had the Treaty of Versailles and all the things that ended the Great War, World War One, as we would later know it. And so they do feel a little bullish. That is, I think, a really great point that needs to be instilled in the history of World War Two is, is the false confidence. And that's so funny to me, because the French, since I guess, um, like late monarchy through the French Revolution, the reign of terror, then into Napoleon, a ton of fucking European wars in the first half of the 
19th century because of Napoleon and all of this. They're just constantly being dragged about. And you'd think that that level of confidence would not be so high, that the status quo almost never stays put. They just experienced the status quo being pulled apart. They're being attacked by a country that didn't even exist 100 years before. So it's it's uh, I don't know. I, I love that you outline that the the kind of false confidence. Do you did you read about that? A lot of that in your in the scholarship? Well, funny enough, it's because I remember when I was in school in France and our teacher kind of taught us about World War Two. He presented in very simple ways where it's like the French were super confident. So they all kind of just placed their their troops kind of over here. But the Germans just arrived somewhere else <laughs> yeah the Maginot line right they just they invaded yeah. belgium to go around it yeah right but yeah so which is like really evil as fuck but that's exactly what they did yes yeah, so that's so interesting i love that you brought that up yeah yeah so, so france was confident um pretty much i mean that's why france got taken over so quick <laughs> because they were just so confident that yeah we're gonna be fine pretty much or i, I think there's even a netflix film i forgot the name um where it kind of shows, you know, how all the all the European countries were kind of like, no, he's not going to invade Poland. Everything's going to be okay. Then he invades Poland. Right. So, so I, I, I think that was what was happening a lot kind of in Europe where too much confidence. Yeah, because it's – I always – I try not to get caught up in revisionism and try to really look at what I would have thought in the let's say the mid 30s about the situation you have this new kind of dictatorial government in germany they seem to be interested in taking parts of countries around them maybe we let them take you know the anschluss and you know, czechoslovakia and also lorraine or the roar or, or whatever but and kind of build their factories there where they're not supposed to based on the treaty of versailles and all the rest and i wonder how long my own personal tolerance not knowing what happened after that would have been. I think that a lot of people are asking themselves a similar question with Russia and Ukraine now, not with nearly the same gravity um, for global global peace, but a similar situation where it's like, where does it end? What do you let them do? And they pushed it to the extreme limits. Um, yeah. And I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone expected <laughs> them to do that. It's, well, it was it, almost, that's why I think, Luke, I think we might've talked about this last time, but it's like, that's why I almost feel like Nazi Germany was in some way, like some sort of suicidal attack, like thing, like where it's like, they they weren't acting like, an organization after 1941, they weren't acting like an organization that wanted to win, you know, because they had no, they didn't seem to want to reinforce their gains at all. They just were like pushing and pushing and pushing. Very strange. I don't know that I would have expected them to do that. Well, it's also interesting in the case of France, like Nazi Germany really wanted kind of Northern France, they did, because Nazi Germany believed that Northern France was Aryan, but then the Southern France more towards the Mediterranean, they were like, that's the Mediterranean race. I eh, don't like them, them, them as much kind of thing. So again, Nazi Germany applied like a lot of its racial theories, you know, even to France. Because that's what's, again, fascinating with France. France is a very diverse country, actually. Like Nordic people and people from the north are very different, even looking, than people from the south. So that's why Nazi Germany was really intent on Vichy France, pretty much, because they did fit into their Aryan categorization because i even think pretty much nazis even considered uh anglo-saxons kind of england to be part of the their aryan race but they you know didn't like them because they both hated each other right but that's again what makes nazi germany kind of so interesting and i always thought like kind of removing the racial aspect out of nazi germany you're not telling the entire story pretty much because again they were kind of these racist nut jobs and it's interesting because I've stopped referring to Nazi Germany as white supremacists. I have, and I called it call it more a uh, Nordic kind of Aryan supremacy because that that's whole other thing. Because basically, the term white supremacy has been turned into utter nonsense. It has now where everything is white supremacist, which right. actually has, has removed a threat. Where you know because. If you're telling people math is white supremacy, which means the same as the KKK and Nazis, I'm like, whoa, you've just distorted everything. So I stopped using that term. Because um, even when recently, um, you know, how in America has been like uh, some people which they found which have planned things and they're like Latino and things like that. And everyone's like, how can they be a Nazi? Nazis are white. And it's like, you know nothing about Nazis, mate. 
like the Nazis, they're very specific towards wanting the Aryan race, but there was Nazis of different ethnicities. There was Asian Nazis. There was, you know, they also famously, they believed that Iranians were part of the Aryan race. Like the Nazis were very particular as they were. They didn't hate kind of all groups. They just had a very genocidal intent on Jews and the Romani people. They did. So that's why... It is a, that's why it's kind of like, you know, have changed because then you would understand things more in Europe, how, you know, they believe that one ethnic group was superior to all the others pretty much and the others needed to kind of be eliminated. Yeah, the whole race science thing, very, very strange. And now we'll go into the protocols of the elders design when we get into that as well. Um, but yeah, I love, I, I just love kind of underlining, yeah, the, the insanity of, the intent of Nazi Germany. I, I, I can't, I, I agree with you. It's endlessly fascinating. My, my bookshelf on my loft is aligned with books about Nazi Germany. I, I've always been interested in it because I, I it, it's always been so strange to me. Like, how can this be? How could it have this been? And I asked that from almost every perspective, but at the time I would have really been curious what I have been more of like a, cause I look at, I must say, I look at Chamberlain as an example as a, people look at him as like a villain, I look at him as a tragic figure where like mm-hmm. he believed, he really did believe World War I was the end of the, of the line. He was, he was woefully misinformed. I also wonder if like he made different decisions, if anything really would have changed, you know, because um, even when around that time with the phony war and all of that, no one was ready to fight. No one wanted to fight. Um, I don't know. It's it's just it's so it's so fascinating. It's so much more interesting than anything that's happened in the United States. And we're only uh, tangentially really involved in that. I mean, we're much more involved, obviously, in the Pacific. But to your point, they didn't seem to be the racial thing is interesting because I think they use the specific term honorary Aryan for Japanese people. Right. Um, for, for, for a lot of people, right. uh, actually, they use the term honorary Aryan. I mean, the Nazis, as long as, you know, people kind of with with their goal, because they were even pushing that. Uh, propaganda in the middle east they were like iraq is quite famous for it the the farud like so they just wanted a pure europe they did pretty much but also a lot of people don't know this but the holocaust was also happening in north africa too so it happened in libya algeria it did because when nazis kind of partnerships with vichy france partnerships slash occupation whatever it is right Vichy France and Italy, they decide to start putting the Jews of those areas in camps too. So the Jews in those areas, they were lucky because it was hard to get over to the killing centers because there's a whole sea, but they were in, in labor camps. They had the star placed on them. They had all the other things that those countries uh, had. So Nazi Germany did really have an intent on genociding all the Jews everywhere. It wasn't just the Jews of Europe. So let's say if Nazi Germany would have won, it just would have continued off pretty much. I think it would have eventually, you know, reached the Middle East, not necessarily invaded it, but, you know, done more partnerships with them, North Africa. Um, so that's really what I think, uh, again, is kind of the, the scale of the thing because the Nazis' intent was really to get, it was kind of t- like you said pretty much even like suicidal like they were so obsessed like we have to kill the jews and um, with nazi germany too they were incredibly smart people that they were like these were very very intelligent people and that's why i think it's fascinating when a lot of people think oh we saw anti-semitism with education oh it's just dumb people not educated people are anti-semitic and i'm kind of like well when i look at world war ii it's kind of the educated people who were actually the worst. It was through universities. It was through all the all those things. So that's what I think is quite fascinating because maybe because, because again, because I come from a countryside in France and people from rural areas tend to be more simple. It's not simple in a way that I'm insulting them, but more like, oh, I just hang out. They're more not simple-minded, but more... Because <sighs> I don't want to sound insulting, because I don't yeah, mean no, I to understand. be. Yeah, but they, they 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 won't have as much time to be like, I hate these people, I hate this, mm-hmm. and so that's what again what is very fascinating with um, the Holocaust. And if you look among righteous among the nations, you always have these stories of these 
rich people have managed to save a lot of people because they had positions of power, all that. But a lot of the people who just saved like a couple of Jews had them hit. They were all just very simple farmers, very simple people. And that's, again, what's fascinating. I, I think I've come to believe that someone more educated doesn't mean they're less racist. It can sometimes make it worse. It can. So that's why, you know, Holocaust education, I think, in its current form, and many educators actually believe this now, is not doing the job. They uh, even had famously, uh, there was a recent educator from a museum, can't name who, who told me, and she was like, she was kind of like, why are we teaching kids to be Nazis? Where she was like, why are we teaching them how to do genocide <laughs> pretty much? Like, because you go so much into detail, isn't mm -hmm. that? And you don't present kind of the, you're not humanizing the victims. You're not like presenting a story where it's like, this is who these people were, this and that. You're just presenting all the facts, all the stats, which is great for history buffs like, like me, for example. But for the average person, it doesn't really connect them or make them even realize the scale of it. Because if you just tell someone, boom, six million, that's a lot to kind of comprehend because that number is utterly insane. It is. And then pretty much even the way the Holocaust was done, like pe people, a lot of people just shot, a lot of people just died of illness. So it wasn't just, you know, how it's commonly known, how people think it was all the gas chambers. There was camps, Outswitch is the most famous one because most people survived from Outswitch, but the other ones were just straight up death camps they were. So that's what I mean, it's so complicated and there's so much history to be learned. And that's why I think, you know, if you educate about the Holocaust, the human element is, I believe, the most important part, getting people to empathize and realize how much we've lost, like how much the world has actually lost, like we've lost in Europe. I often tell people, because all people like to be like, the Nazis didn't win. I'm like, they did. They, they wiped out Jewish life out of Europe. They killed 95% of the Polish Jews. They won. They did really. Because even if you look at it, there's more Jews in France now than before World War II. But the rest of Europe, no one. Like, it's all, you know, say, for example, in Israel it is, in America, but Europe is wiped out. So the Nazis won. And I think since I approached that with my, that kind of mentality, I think it changes from what kind of stories you tell. Yeah, that's a, that's a really fascinating answer. I was writing down, I was writing down so many notes as you were talking about different things. Um, one of the fascinating angles, I think, too, of World War II, and you'll probably yeah. agree, even in the Nazis going into Northern Africa and, and dealing with the Middle East and Japan, of course, being embargoed by the United States before they attack Pearl Harbor is how much a lot of it even then wrapped around oil and the access to oil and uh, like their their maneuvers through various places are identical to what would be needed today. It's like some things just stay the same and some things they certainly don't. And I, I love what you said about education, which just it is true. We, we are only, I guess. Pop culture's only access to Nazi education was really through stuff with the White Rose and and all of that. And we never really got a, a greater glimpse into obviously how things are structured around race science and like the SS the SS's obsession with archaeology and and almost paganism and this Nordic, like you said, mm -hmm. religion. And it's interesting that they had such a religious drive, such a furious um drive a very kamikaze like drive from their fascist friends in japan um but we're not religious in in that way which is why i think religion can be it can mean many different things and their religion was this this arianism this this it, it to yeah. me i guess you would describe it as pagan in some way well no no it, yeah. it, it it was kind of religion i mean they had like a lot of things were kind of invented you know their whole nazi science pretty much but also so that's one thing which i did disagree with Two, which happens a lot in America, where they often like say Christians are Nazis or, you know, this and that. And I'm like, no, the Nazis weren't, they weren't that fond of Christianity. They weren't, they kind of had their own thing. And that's again to your point of paganism, all those things. So occultism, like they really had right. their, own, their own thing. And I think that's why I think it's more in America, there's a lot of Holocaust distortion, as I call it. It's more Holocaust distortion than denial. Like even when I see 
again, everyone compare everything to Nazis. Let's say, for example, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I think she's an idiot. I don't think she's a Nazi, though. Like a Nazi, that's that's really it's, it's a, to accuse someone of a Nazi is really like <laughs> ne- next level, and that's that's why again I think it's a form of Holocaust distortion. Like how um, I even think, like say for example, if even January six, like when people make comparisons to Crystal Nut, I'm like, no, that's not at all the same thing. So that's what is interesting in America, and I think it really shows that. People are aware of the Holocaust a lot. Ask them, they make all these comparisons, but they know nothing about it. And that's what I noticed again with the mainstream press. They literally know nothing about Nazis. And that's why when, you know, when there's, say, for example, Latino Nazis that, that happen in America, they lose all their mind. And the articles appear nonsensical because they're basically writing, white supremacist Latino. And everyone's looking at it like, what the fuck is he talking about? Kind of thing. I mean, yeah. So that- <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, go. I was just going to say, I, I find that strange too With on the other side with the, the clear neo-Nazi elements of the Ukrainian military where they, oh, have yeah, to, yeah. Like, where they have to pretend that that doesn't exist, where I'm like, oh, it does exist. Like, and there, there it is. And like, you're on, you're kind of, when you're in this muddy situation, that's kind of who you're arm in arm with right now. Got to be careful about both how you're ter- how you're throwing the term around and how you're ignoring the actual Nazi the, the, or neo Nazi elements in front of you. Please, that was is interesting because again, I am super pro Ukraine. I am even to the point where I think even if it's a terrible military plan, I'm even like Europe should get involved. That that's how much pro Ukraine wow. I am. But I'm admitting I'm not a politician, mm-hmm. and it's probably a terrible idea. So thank God I'm not you know leading the armies, but. When you see like Ukraine pretty much push, put up photos and it's like, mate, that guy has a Nazi tattoo. What the fuck are you kind of doing? Mm-hmm. And I do think that is very interesting how, because again, in times of war, you make, you make allies, you get as many people as you can, because you're not thinking you need, we need to win this war. But that is a very interesting thing, how America, it's a problem. It is because I even see this being a problem for after for when hopefully Ukraine wins, you know, and Russia's out of Ukraine. But then I'm kind of like, what's going to happen then? There's a lot of Nazis who are kind of rising up and, you know, are they going to try and take over this and that? So there's so many different different complicated uh, things. That's why Ukraine also has a complicated kind of... Uh, history too because ukraine does um the jews of ukraine are very much like you know fighting for ukraine and ukraine government has passed lots of great bills they have so they elected the jewish president president but you know there's that's the thing there's always going to be nazis anywhere there is so so i kind of view again america i don't view america as being the exception where there's more nazis than say in america there's nazis everywhere it's an ideology that's never going to go away it isn't, but we must be careful not to mainstream them and, again, also not distort them. Again, what the American press is kind of doing. And that's why I think, it, that's what, that's why I think there's a rise of Nazism in, in the U.S. is because, again, the mainstream media, all the anti-hate groups, no one really knows what a Nazi is. And that's what I think is absolutely fascinating. It yeah, is. I agree. It, there, words have become both very we have these like hyper distinct words and, and then words that have broad or even no meaning anymore which i find strange all over society um i wanted to and by the way i think it's so interesting to hear you talk a little bit about i would love to know more about it offline we can talk about your idea for europe even having some sort of coalition to fight back because i agree that i want ukraine to win but i don't want anything to to do with it here in the United States, I, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to bait war. You know, I, I, I think it's because being in Europe, right? It's 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 different kind of thing. But that's you know again, topic can be a different topic. But yeah. I'll, I'll end with this. I will say, Please. I think Europe should accept Ukraine into the European Union way before, and and when they're accepting them now, I'm like, guys, that's a bit late because I do think that might have. Russia might not have come in as much because it'd be like, oh, we have shit we have to deal with all, all of Europe. But also, it's again, it comes from they're kind of European. We've, we're used to having them. This and that. So that's like, I mean, it is a very different thing com- 
had to Mac where Mac is completely on the other side. You yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. To- it's, it's a, a, we have a me- mega advantage. We have peaceful neighbors on the, in the North and South, although we are, our neighbors to the South are, are funneling fentanyl uh, through into the United States, but otherwise we have peaceful relations and huge oceans on each side of us. So yeah, America, America's, yeah. America's fine. <laughs> it is, so that's what I mean. It is, it's a whole European kind of thing. It is. And it just, I think to a lot of people, it brought up like trauma of World War II. A lot of people like countries are thinking, oh shit, is Russia going to invade next us? It's all whole complicated whole thing, but I am very much, I hope it stops because it needs needs to stop. It does, but you know, again, I'm not a politician. <laughs> yeah, not. me neither. And I and I'm I'm more interested in domestic stuff anyway. Um, all right, let me get back to your game. I I wanted to ask you about this next thing here. So we talked about them gathering around the radio and hearing about the Polish invasion, and we go to fast forward to May of 1940, where the Nazis go into France and I think completely take or not completely, but I guess occupy it in terms of Paris by July or summer of that year. At this point, you show extensive real German shot footage, it looks like, um, of the occupation. What was uh, I I had not seen a lot of this footage and I thought it was really, really fascinating to look at. What made you want to kind of cut back in with real life footage at this point in the game? So I thought it was important because the video game is animated it's kind of cartoony it's like a graphic novel so it was important to kind of show the truth basically it's that's why in between there's photos that's why there's footage because it again it's just showcasing the truth every time it is so it was really that simple it was. yeah I, I loved it i i, I love seeing World War II footage becomes a little rote after a while. You feel like you've seen a lot of it. That's what was so funny about the, or fun, not funny, but fun about those various documentaries that came out, like World War II and Color and all of these things where they found all this new archival footage. So you kind of get a fresh perspective on it. So I love seeing some new things. And I especially love seeing things from the enemy perspective. A laughing Nazi soldier is a pretty interesting piece of footage. Well, right? especially, I mean, especially that we, we wrote like music on top of it. Everything so it kind of really did fit. It did. So... I, I thought it was one of the more effective things, and that's why I think, again, with the mainstream press, they were very supportive and very much like that because, you know, kind of in most um, World War II games, you don't kind of show these things in between, and I think it is very effective. It is. After this footage is shown, back in the game, um, the mom and dad, the you know Moses and Bluma, are kind of, agonizing do they stay or do they go i mean what what's the move here um and what's interesting is he and you feel bad i mean again you see things through a modern lens so it's hard not to but calls his wife paranoid i think and claims that they would be homeless for no reason that 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 she feels the exact opposite that if they stay they'll die um it's unclear who has the upper hand but i wrote here in my notes like the choice ultimately didn't matter this is what we get back to over and over again and um I like that after this, Samuel goes, uh, or I'm sorry, Moses goes back to his his uh, his store to make the box doll. And I wanted to ask you specifically about this. How did you choose to gamify the game? Because this is a kind of a, just a small mini game, as it were, right? It's very simple, but you're picking the pieces, putting it into a shape. There's a different part later on in the game where there's almost like a Tetris-like grid as you're placing mm-hmm. packages from the store. Um, there's obviously the game begins with, uh, you know, Simon says Jacques Adi. Um, I wonder where this kind of notion came from. Is it supposed to be ironic in well, some way? So, so, so I, actually it's because I did have advisors at one point and they were trying to get me, and these were part of course, uh, education kind of advisors. And they wanted me to nearly gamify it a bit more where I'm, Kind of like, you know, Through the Darkest of Times, you know, is quite gamified, it is. Um, but I couldn't really do that. I couldn't, that's how come the choices lead to nothing because mm-hmm. that was intentional. And kind of these small mini games, because honestly, I was kind of like, okay, we do have to break this up because otherwise you'd just be walking around all the time and talking, it would. 
so that's why for the fox, you know, I was like, okay, it fits with the story. You're making the fox for the boxes. Okay, if you're moving, you actually have to decide where to put the boxes. So that's why they're there pretty much. They aren't revolutionary, and that's the interesting thing because I am very much like, yeah, this game does not revolutionize anything gameplay-wise at all. But it's because it's so hard to quote unquote gamified holocaust it's near impossible it is so that's why they were kind of there to break up the monotony they were honestly and just to kind of fit the scene because if you wanted to kind of again show you know gamify it you'd really just be gamifying how nazis did a genocide and then you'd be teaching people how to do a genocide so that's why it's very complicated, and I decided instead to kind of go choose the emotional, empathetic route kind of for this video game rather than, say, video game mechanics. And that's what I think actually has worked because people describe this more as an emotional experience rather than a video game. That's kind of, it's kind of it's a weird thing. And even when The Guardian did a review of it, they didn't give it a score. <laughs> they didn't because it is. It's one of those games where it's like, okay, if we, if we know this based on a game, this is very simple, but this game is more than just a video game, it is. So that's why it's, yeah, it's a complicated thing to even kind of describe. I, and, and again, if I made it more like Telltale games where you had lots of different choices and you can change the outcome, I would have completely distorted the Holocaust in that case. So that's why it's, very complicated it is to do a video game about the Holocaust if it's not from a resistance point of view because that'd be easy. Guns shooter, very much. And I, I think if, because Through the Darkest of Times, it's kind of like a German resistance game, right? But Germany won that active in the resistance, you know? So, and it's interesting because the developers of that game, I think it was them, who said pretty much that when they show off the game, Germans come up to them and they're like, yeah, yeah, my grandparents were in the resistance, this and that. And they were kind of like, well, if that many people that come up to us say their parents were in the resistance, I'm pretty sure we would have overthrown Nazi Germany. So that's why it's very intentional it was. It's, it's a video game, it's not a game. It's, it's so weird. Yeah, I totally understand that because I think going into the game, you could almost assume that it would just be a walking simulator type game. And I actually like those kinds of games where sometimes where it's, you know, everybody's gone to the rapture or gone home or something where you're kind of just experiencing it. And I think that's totally fine. So I found some sort of intrinsic irony in the presentation of that, that I thought really resonated with the dark theme where it's like, look how trivial. Let's get back to the real thing. You know, um, I think that that balance, even if unintentional, was certainly found and was awesome. Um, I wanted to talk about this character, Bernard. And we meet him. He's one of my favorite characters. <laughs> yeah, he's an interesting. He's an interesting character. He's he's uh, falling in love with lots of different women, and he's very French and vive la France. Um, we find out later about his true origins. Um, but I wonder what what you were trying to say with this character, because what it seemed to me to say, and maybe I'm just interpreting it too literally, is um, in these situations, it didn't matter how you tried to change your facade or change yourself, they would always see you as Jewish. Um, and you got into this, you got into this later with the Michelings and all the rest as well. Um, when you're explaining things towards the end of the game, I'm wondering if that was kind of the intention that like, you can't undo in the eyes of the Nazis, you couldn't undo your Jewishness, well, no matter what you tried. And even if you tried to hide amongst them, they would find you and sniff you out. Um, I so, wonder if there was some intent so, to that. So, so, so is that too, because the reality is also, um, when I just look at photos, even from like Germany, you you can tell who's Jewish and who's German. Like you you could really tell. I mean, that's why anti-Semitic caricatures look a certain way. I mean, in terms of the character designs, uh, the Jewish characters are designed differently than the non-Jewish characters. They're just small things, pretty much, which people might not notice, to make them look more ethnic. But with, with Bernard. As a character, is great for multiple reasons for the story which I'm telling. So, of course, doing most, a lot of the game, he's kind of like the humorous one. He pretty much is oblivious. He's just like, I'm French, I'm eating pork, what's Judaism, all those things. And he really does represent what 
happen with Sephardic Jews, where Sephardic Jews turned super French. <laughs> they did. That became their number one identity. But then also, it was important to show when, because he doesn't care about Judaism, so he converts to Christianity at one point, just for one of his girlfriends. And that was very important to me, because in America, even among Jewish people, a lot of people think the Holocaust was a religious genocide, not a racial genocide. And I was like, this is a huge problem, because even when I saw like Ilan Omar, who pretty much all the time is like religious genocide, I'm like, do you not know anything about the Holocaust, pretty much? Mm. And also, a lot of Jewish Christians, well, they got killed too. They were considered part of the, there's even a famous nun, famous nun called Edith Stein, who pretty much murdered because she, she's Jewish. So that allowed me to really show without kind of, you know, trying to just put text up and be like, it was a racial genocide, to really show to the audience, this was a racial genocide, not a religious one. And it was, the Christian Jews got all killed. They did. So there's that. He, he serves us multiple things. Again, like, no matter how, like you said, no matter how French she was, he, he was a Jew, pretty much. And that's how the Nazis and anti semites saw him. And that's how even anti-Semitism today works out. A Jew is a Jew, no matter what, no matter if, if they convert, no matter if they're not religious, you know, that's how anti-Semitism works. So he was able to show that, but also, again, to address it was a racial genocide. And I, I do think, even because the funny enough, I was talking about this on, on Twitter, where I, I do think the, the Jews who are Christian who died, their lives matter too. Because to me, first and foremost, Jewish is an ethnicity to me, you know? And so that's why I think it's it's important to also bring that up so then people can also kind of know. Because that's what I think some people appreciate it with this game too is that it, sh it had more, quote-unquote, diversity in terms of how we're showing the Holocaust. Like, because Bernard is a Sephardic Jew, and lots of people think it was only the Ashkenazi Jews, but 10,000 Sephardic Jews got killed in France, they did. So Greece, it was like over 86% pretty much a Greek Sephardic Jews who got killed. So it was kind of important to also show the other victims. Because again, in America, everyone knows about Poland, they do. So he served multiple. And I think him also being a kind of funny character makes him more, um, how can I say, people get attached to him quicker. Yeah, he's parents, relatable. In, in yeah, the parents are a lot more serious, they are. But him, just him being so utterly stupid pretty much just always just being obsessed with woman just not knowing what's going on most of the time you know i think really is the average person it is yeah he's i, I love what you were saying about him because as the player i enjoyed kind of the underlining of what you were saying which is that being jewish is not the same as being christian and that being Christian is the description of a religion that implies a nationality maybe of like I'm Italian and Irish through ancestry. So that does suggest that I would be Catholic. Right. And so, mm -hmm. but, but it's true in my own experience, having grown up on, and I, we talked about this deeply on the last episode, but having grown up on Long Island, born and raised where that's one of the greatest concentrations of Jewish people in the entire world um, and or in the New York tri-state area. And you kind of grow up, understanding that implicitly that being jewish is more than a religion it's kind of a people bound by experience also geography in some sense a biblical tradition whatever the case might be and i also like that he underlines this reality that um well it's not quite as underlined as i thought because you find out later that um he himself had had immigrated but i like how and we brought this up a little bit earlier that the game focuses on first on and I, I guess this is expressed during the green ticket roundup, which I want you to talk about. Um, but instead of scapegoating French Jews, they first scapegoat foreign Jews, it looks mm -hmm. like. And I want you to talk to me a little bit about this. You have it as May 14th, 1941. I knew these kinds of roundups existed, but I had never heard about this one specifically. So I went and read about it. And it was really interesting, this mass arrest. And I like how you force the player to participate. And, you know, obviously we bounce through the different characters at different times, but now we're um, 
playing as Bluma going and collecting your goods, not knowing that this is the last time you're ever going to see your husband alive or ever. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the kind of the focus on the foreign Jews first and then how that cascaded down towards so, the rest of them. So, so basically the, the French government sought, you know, we give Nazi Germany kind of first the foreign Jews, the Polish Jews, pretty much, you know, before they kind of go after, before they want our, our Jews. And it was very targeted specifically towards Polish Jews, it was. And when they were kind of put in the camp, they kind of remained there for a year. But the interesting thing was, inside those camps, the Polish Jews, if you look at them, they even became super French. So you have them when you still look at photos. They're there with their cigarettes and berets, pretty much. <laughs> they, they look stereotypical. And for that entire year, they were kind of like, why are we here? It, it, it's war. So lots of people just assumed it's war, pretty much, because like, they were also working too. So they weren't assuming kind of the worst. And that's why, you know, the camp scenes are a lot compared to, you know, say scenes in uh, things which have to do with outs, which they're just kind of, you know, hanging out and just kind of, you know, either being bored or like trying to figure out what's going on. So that was, uh, again, important to show because that's really when it started to happen in France and why some people, that's why the biggest French resistance group was led by an Armenian guy, an Armenian genocide survivor, Misak Manushian. And he knew what the fuck was going on. So Armenian genocide survivors who were in France <clears throat> knew what was going on. They were like, this is something's up here. So, so yes, that was <clears throat> again important to the story. And it also shows again the different steps it does. And also, you know, Bloomer. That, that did work out pretty much because that's exactly the, the real documents too. You actually had to go to the police station with your spouse or friend and then they kept you there and then the friend had to go and grab all your stuff. And again, you didn't know, you didn't think this would be the last time you didn't see them. You, you just thought, again, it's war pretty much. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I mean, it's, I loved the inclusion of the real documents, by the way, and it's, it is, it's just wild that people were put in these positions and um, again, just trying to see it through contemporaneous eyes as opposed to eyes of with hindsight. Um, so we see now that Moses, the son is left. Uh, I'm sorry. Moses, the father is left. Samuel, the son is with Bluma still in the apartment. I guess they're ostensibly still running the business. There's discussions here at this time. And I wanted to ask you about these of refugees and kind of not being able to get out were there any countries at this time? So I guess this is in like 1941. Um, who was, what was the situation for getting Jews out of Europe? Um, I know that America's continued relationship with France and this game speaks to this, that I guess there is some way to secure visas and escape to America, but this seems to be some sort of official channel. And I wonder, it's, I, it's, I, I, I don't know. Talk to me about this. It was, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, pretty much people were trying but no one managed to, best of my knowledge. So it was kind of before, because again, the UK closed their borders, they did. So to the best of my knowledge, it it you weren't really able to kind of immigrate, because again, most people would have left, they would have. So that's kind of, yeah, again, to the best of my knowledge, and that's why a lot of um, uh, Jews who are in France were trying to make it to the Zone Libre, and that's why when you know Nazi Germany invades, you know one of the scenes that you see, you know, kind of right after the German footage, you see a lot of people packing to start leaving. So, yeah, to the best of my knowledge, it just it was still like kind of a crapshoot. It was. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's wild, man. There's probably just a ton. Of individual yeah, yeah, stories. Yeah, I, I, actually, now I can even remember. Yeah, because I even remember. I know a survivor who, pretty much, um, she couldn't go, so she managed to make over to Spain, gave her two babies away, pretty much, and then from Spain, those kids went on a boat that went over to America from Spain, pretty much. But she had to just give up her children, and she couldn't enter from the border she couldn't crazy. so yeah it's mostly so now think about it 
it was more cases of basically babies who are managing to kind of make it, but not the adults. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, you you experience it in the game too, just the agony of separation and not knowing, especially during a much more analog time, because it's even expressed during the letters. You know, the few letters that they get from the parents, kind of running about and trying to find places to be, and hearing all the different rumors. It's just the terror and fear. I think plays there really well. Um, I wanted to finally get to this Mister Grosjean character. Um this kindly Christian customer that we meet in the beginning of the game. And this is such a great bait and switch because, and these notes are written sequentially in the beginning. I write back at school or back at the shop after school, Samuel helps Mr. Grosjean find a tie for Easter at church and indicate, and this is what I wrote in my notes, an indication that everyone was against them, perhaps some more unity than we think. So in other words, people weren't really judging them as being Jewish or other and just kind of dealing with them in the economy, dealing with them as friends in school, whatever. And then I wrote, uh Oh, in, handwritten notes next to it because later (laughs) on um we find that he's quite the opposite an amazing twist and he says i think quote unquote jews can no longer be trusted to own businesses and that he's filed with local administrators in vichy france to take their business over and seizing it he's basically a traitor to them this is unbelievable i was wondering if this is inspired by a real story or a real tale or what what you're trying to say with this because i thought you were trying to say something very different with this character than what you ended up saying about him well, yeah, I mean, it is pretty much kind of what was happening. So Jewish businesses were being transferred over to French, quote unquote, French people, uh, pretty much. So him, kind of the whole Easter thing and Christian thing was more to show, oh, look, French, people are French, French, because they want people to assume he was Jewish, right? Are fine. This and that, everything works well within society. But again, society changed within a matter of years like even when people rounding jews up they started cheering they started this and that so he really more is demonstrating society he is um not necessarily him himself so that's really what his character is it's a representation of um where french intellectual and kind of like high-end society was uh heading yeah it's unbelievable it was an unbelievable twist uh, because that character could have kind of remained in, a, in an inertial state from his first introduction, and you would see him in another thing where he comes in and apologizes and can't believe what's happening as they're taken away, and he's like the guy that could have done more, or didn't do enough, but he's actually the guy that stabbed them in the back. And I think that that's that it, it's the it shows the the grayness and the texture of situations like this, I guess. Um, and then later on, right after this, Bluma is kind of beginning to fall apart. She says, "Quote: If we cooperate, they have no reason to come after us." Because that's what all people thought. Right, of course. However, I would think that she's frustrating to me in this sense because even if I were looking at it through the modern lens, because it's like, dude, they already took your husband. Like, are you going to wake up now? You know, like they took your business. Are you going to wake up now? And she just keeps wanting to cooperate for their lives. But this shows the total Hobson's choice, like the complete catch-22 that they're in, that there is no good choice now. Like there's nothing, you either run or you stay, they're probably going to catch you if you run. You might even look more guilty if you run. But if you stay, you're easy to find. They know where you are. They can come and get you anyway. I mean, this is this is truly terrifying. Um, but, talk to but, me a little bit about, about this mentality. Well, so that's also actually another interesting thing because um, this, hap- this happens with a lot of, uh, how can I say, like, it, it, it's it, not, not everyone, but it happens with a few kind of Israeli nationalists where they're basically being like, um, Jews didn't fight enough, this and that, we were weak. And it's like, Mm -hmm. well, no, because a lot of people were put in impossible situations. Say, imagine if Bloomer fought back, joined the resistance. Maybe, who knows what could have happened to her husband, because now she's going against the state. She is, that puts her family in danger. And that's why within the ghettos kind of in Eastern Europe, Jews were discussing things. They were like, should we fight back? But then they were like, if we fight back, they might murder our families. They might come on us even extra harder. So that was basically really the impossible situation put upon people. And that's why French resistance was coming a lot from the free areas it was and things like that. Because when you were, when you, once you had a family member detained, you didn't know 
what you could do, what could happen to them and the consequences. And that's why she kind of does change because she's in this state where she doesn't know what to do. Her no idea what's going on with her parents. Her husband's been taken away. Maybe if we just collaborate, maybe this might all end. Maybe this might stop. And that's how a lot of people were thinking because, again, you know, because it was analog, all those things, no one really knew everything was going on. There's always rumors, there's always things like that. So you, you know, it's kind of unthinkable, it was, pretty much what happened. So that's that's why she's kind of goes all over the place. She's broken. I mean, she gets her source of income taken away from her, her husband. She can't immigrate or go anywhere, no idea where her parents are. So it's kind of like, you become lost in those situations. And a lot of people assume, you know, you get angry and you start doing the resistance, this and that. And I'm sorry, that's that's uh, that's nearly a privileged point of view. Everyone thinks of themselves of like, yeah, I would have fought back, I would have done this and that. But when you're put in that, that impossible situation, you literally don't know what to do. Yeah, I can't even imagine the fear. And I guess Warsaw would be the biggest example of people fighting back, right? Um but I, I just, I don't know. It's interesting to hear about that from kind of more the nationalist Israelis, that, that perspective, because you can definitely see a reflection in modern Israel of like a literal never again in capital letters. And, that's that's yeah. what I think Israel is so like this now. Even if majority of Israelis aren't descendants of Holocaust survivors, so mostly Mizrahi, Sephardic, you know, that's that's why Israel is the kind of how it is. You have to look at pretty much where they're kind of like never again, and that means to them, arming themselves, having a strong army, all those things. And it is inter interesting, you know, how trauma kind of operates and changes people, you know, because you have someone like, um, say, for example, you know. <laughs> one of the most because they constantly talk about him george soros you know who's pretty much like i think the way to solve everything is you know super liberal ideas this and that and some people think it's strong army so it's just it's, it's fascinating how all those responses to genocide and trauma how they operate yeah it's it's crazy man it, it there's so much more to say about that topic but in moving on i wanted to talk a little bit about propaganda and the propagandization of um society uh you look at this you bring up this thing and i i again i never heard of this so i went and read about it the jews in france exposition in paris this is crazy uh september of 1941 through the spring of 1942 i think it was there and it was basically this museum style exhibition <laughs> exhibition uh, exhibi uh, exposition about identifying Jewish people and stereotyping them and kind of the, the assumptions and presumptions about them, uh, tying them. As I said earlier, this is, I think, along with maybe some earlier propaganda, really tying them into Bolshevism and communism as well. And everything that is, quote unquote, polluting French society, as it is noted in the game. This is another interesting thing, along with, like I said, the green ticket roundup, and the Jews Among Thorns, this is another really interesting touchstone in the history of World War II. I'm curious why you wanted to bring this particular one up, especially surrounding what happens with Moses when he's outcast by his peers. You can tell that if the children are captured, then the, the adults are already captured, and that this seemed to have been a pretty serious issue of just complete stereotyping, othering them, making it easier to remove them from society. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what... French France was actually doing it was entering into pure propaganda it was I mean that whole museum was all the stereotypes there's even like Jews control uh, the film industry they're polluting French culture this is how you recognize them and what was fascinating with their exposition and when you go up and talk to one of the characters one of the characters is just like I just went there for a food card because the exposition was starting to flop it was hmm. so in order to get people there they were kind of giving it out food cards they were so you know so people didn't could you know be forced to kind of go there. right someone remarks that on the street when you talk to them that they they, they were happy <laughs> yeah. they got their food card or whatever 
Yes, yeah, so that's what, again, makes it interesting because, you again, you had like kind of French elites, wealthy people who are kind of like, yeah, look at the Jew. The Jew is doing this and that. And to kind of get the poorer people is like, because they weren't attending, was we give you kind of food cars. But it was kind of showed the propaganda because a lot of people think it was only Nazi Germany. And I'm like, no, no, it was throughout all of Europe it was. So that was, again, an important thing to kind of show. It was because... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Okay, no, go ahead. I was just going to ask, could you underline like the specific ties to communism? Like, what was that all about? Making Jews into into uh, like Bolshevik agents? This was, I guess, pure just fear of the uh, of the Reds and and making them the same. I think it was fear of the Reds, but also in France. So before the Vichy government came to power. You did also have Leon Blum, and Leon Blum was a prime minister of France, and he was socialist, he was. So he pretty much was very much, he created like the 40-hour work week, he created like unions, all those things. So you did have, again, from the wealthier people who are more like, or wealthier, you know, politicians who are more like, what is this guy doing very much? Like, he is so... The, the, the reality is, is this true, is that Jews during that time were kind of more left-leaning. They were pretty much mm. in Europe, but they kind of took it to the extreme where it's like straight up your communists kind of thing. Right, as opposed to like the intellectual left or something of that nature, you know, like yeah. separating the two. Yeah, yeah. So so, so that's what so – that's why the Nazis like – and they took elements – I don't know, some people might think it, because I don't want people to just clip this and be like, look, he said that Nazis were right. But they took some things which were arguably a bit true, you know, like how lots of left-leaning Jews they were pretty much, because, you know, if you went more right and it ended up far right in Europe, they want to kill you. So, of course, you'd be more like to the left, Mm -hmm. you would. And kind of extremed it, like how they did with racial science, how they did kind of with everything. So that's why it is, because cause even, cause even my grandmother, she was pretty much a socialist type. And, you know, she was alive, but she was in England during those times. But why she was like that is because she thought that was the answer to fighting Nazis in the far right, you know? So it wasn't... Because even Mitek Mnuchin, French resistance group, they consider themselves communists and all those things. So it wasn't, it was kind of a reaction, it was, to what was happening with the far right, pretty much. So, but, and again, I don't think, I don't think most people realized how bad communism was. They probably were like, this sounds great on paper. And, you know, probably didn't realize how bad Soviets were, this and that. So, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's basically what I mean. Because, you know, again, we lived it, it was the analog days. It was so a lot right. easier to do propaganda, a lot harder to actually do your own research. But, yeah, and, and, and I think, again, it, it's just, it's just again, anti-Semitic kind of things. Because if, if, if you look at it, you know, um, if you look even, even in, in, in America or Jeremy Corbyn, those kind of things in the UK, it's like Jews are like super right. They're super conservative. They're controlling everything, your money, this and that. So when you're an anti when you're an anti-Semitic person, no matter if you're from the right or left, you always view Jews as the opposite of that other side and more extreme. You do. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that in my own experience. It's just I've been called a Zionist by people on the internet. Um, and I'm like, Jesus, what the hell are you talking about? Um, but speaking of that, I wanted to talk a little bit about when we mentioned earlier, and I promised I'd get back to it, the protocols of the elders of Zion. We talked about Henry Ford and his stuff with, what was it? The international Jew or whatever his, his thing. And, um, and we, I also tied in here into my notes cause this was happening around the same time as it was being explained in the game, the Nuremberg race laws. We had brought up the Michelings before, um, and the idea of Jewish grandparents, and that's how you'd be judged, which we were talking about earlier with uh, Bernard not being able to escape that sort of stuff. And it's at that time that we find out that he's actually from Algeria, a long time colony of France's. 
and he's he's kind of adopted Fran, Fran, uh, the French style and the French nationality, which is fine. I think that's the idea of coming to countries and you know immigrating. Yeah, that's, that's, pre, that's pretty much what what happened with Sephardic Jews. Uh, the moment France pretty much were like you become French, they started becoming super French, and France liked that because they were integrating really well. They were. I mean, that's why even today. You know, majority of Jews of France are Sephardic, and the first thing you'll ask them if you say, for example, you're like, "What are you?" They'd be like, "I'm French. I love France." So that's what again made makes it interesting make, and important. Yeah. That must make French people really happy. I mean, that's what I would, I would I love to see in the United States when people adopt being American. I think that that's the entire idea. So that's cool. But I'm wondering if you talked a little bit a little bit about um, the protocols of the elders' design, which I would assume is. And you could correct me, you would know more about this, but maybe one of the most effective and famous pieces of propaganda ever. Um, yeah, because it, it's influenced everyone. It's influenced the far left. It's influenced the far right. And it it, yeah, it, it is actually the most effective uh, propaganda, one of the most effective propaganda books kind of ever made. So, so I think kind of not mentioning it when it comes even to the Holocaust and things like that, it's you have to mention it kind of in some way because because people read it and again you know very analog back then so you know you know how people when they insult us on the internet they're like you don't read books or you must read books you know it sounds like it's a book so therefore this means it's right right so that's right. why a lot of people got very um influenced by it and it's brought up often during Nuremberg trials it was and it is, yeah, one of the most influential books. So even if it's just there quickly, how the cafe owner pretty much, you know, read reads this book and then he thinks he knows everything, right? And and that's pretty much how a lot of people do act once they've read it or kind of read the uh, inspirations from it. Because you can just see it on Twitter. You can pretty much when you're kind of dealing with anti-Semitic people, so just repeating like the same tropes of the protocols of the elders of zion yeah it's a it's i don't i don't know the the full history of it and you can correct me if i'm wrong but it's supposed to be written from the perspective of a jewish person right and it came out i think around the turn of the century and uh was i guess uh, an un it's an un very unflattering and i guess sinister portrayal of the perspective of a of a Jewish person, right? Or the Jewish perspective. And people took it as being canon. It reminds me a little bit. It's like you're saying when I was a little kid in the late eighties and early nineties, like, I was like, is wrestling real? I have no, I have no way of confirming if this is real or not. It must be, it must <laughs> That's be how real. I felt as a kid too. Right, right. Exactly. Without being able to kind of sift through all of that. And so it, it, it establishes somewhat, although I think it happens even in the 19th century with other writers too, but it, it establishes some sort of like faux intellectual basis for the way people feel and like the anti-Semitic tropes that would come to fruition as the 20th century evolved. And you had brought up Henry Ford as being a really great example of just complete anti-Semite. Um, yeah, because he, he was a very smart guy. He, I mean, he was a very smart guy. Like he created so many things like the hero of the American industrial, industrialism, like, but yet he was a massive, obsessed, crazy, anti-semite <laughs> he was and, and that's that's again the problem with um with all people not understanding anti-semitism it can affect some of the smartest people ever because the way everything was written this and that it was presented in a very intellectual way so you're kind of like yeah this, this makes sense what about the i brought him up a couple times but the nuremberg race laws i'm actually unclear on this so the, the Nuremberg race law said if three or four of your grandparents were Jewish, you were Jewish. And then there were a whole nother group of people with one or two Jewish grandparents. Were they not, were they separated out by that even to be killed? If you, so if you had like a, if you were a quarter Jewish, were you okay? So in, in uh, Germany, right, if you're kind of like a Michelin, in lots of cases, you just were kind of under shit laws, pretty much. So you weren't necessarily sent out to be murdered, but you're kind of like limited by a lot of things. There was even some Michelins who were actually part of the Nazi army. There was too. 
uh, pretty much. I think even Hitler's chauffeur was like considered a Michelin. He was. So you basically, you weren't, you didn't have as much, you weren't necessarily like sent off to be genocided. You weren't, if you were Michelin, because maybe I think the Nazis thought like, okay, if this person has babies was an alien, we can kind of get the Jewish blood out of them. So that's what was interesting. But also at the same time too, I mean, you really did have families kind of torn apart, this and that. So if the husband were fully Jewish, he'd be sent off. He would, and if the mother was kind of Michelin, just discrim- dis- discrimination laws pretty much, but not necessarily sent off. So a lot of it, I would say, I'm not necessarily an expert on all things Michelin, case by case, kind of things like that, pretty much, but not compared to people of pure Jews, they were fucked. They were. Yeah. And we get into that with, yeah, some of these characters trying their hardest to escape that, but we ultimately get to the end of the game where no one escapes. And um, this seemed to be, it's funny because I was, uh, I was on PSN profiles, which is like a trophies website that I, I frequent and there's a forum for each game mm-hmm. and there's a forum for your game and people had posted in it and a few people had expressed their surprise that no one survives and it, uh, that's totally fine. And I, I, I appreciate that, but it, I, to me, it, it seemed inevitable that that was going to happen or maybe the little kid would find a way out or something, but probably not. And that seems to be a more accurate reflection of the time. I think it underlined, in other words, the need for a game like this to educate people about the realities of this. Um, how do you, how, what about this ending? I mean, what well, about the inevitability of it? Is that what it's all about? The inevitability? Most, I mean, two thirds of European Jews were murdered very much. Most people died. The Veldif roundup, I've, I've, I think it was, Definitely less than 100, even maybe even less than 10 survived that pretty much. So it had to be accurate, it did. And also how I feel, so I love Holocaust films. I do. Uh, Schindler's is fantastic, one of the best, most important films ever made. But at the end, most people survive. You see them alive, this and that. So the audience kind of at the end, it's kind of like a happy ending where you're kind of like leaving it like, okay. So you, you, you kind of ignore most of the things of the Holocaust after that because it's a oh, very hard film to watch, but at the end, you kind of leave it a bit happier. You do. But to me, the Nazis were successful in their genocide and it was important to show that because I think if even one person was survived or this and that, it would have really distorted the the Holocaust and also had a different emotional reaction to people. I think most people would have kind of played the game and actually been not happy, but relieved at the end. And to me, it was very important to show the reality. And that's why when I looked on YouTube, I pay attention to Twitch streamers. They just all kind of, well, I've noticed breakdown at the end. And I think it's, effective in that way because when you have um first they end up all being deported to Auschwitz and dying which is just shown via text but then at the end when i kind of show what their lives could have been Mm -hmm. so it's already that again humanizing them and then after doing the credits when i show the photos that's when people just lose it just bam that's just when it hits them and i think that was the best way to kind of show the reality and actually get people to really care. And it has been effective kind of in, in that regard. And that's why, again, for the mainstream press, like people actually, mainstream press are actually quite amazed that a video game can do this. And I'm kind of like, no, no, there's been loads of video games that have emotional effects. The Last of Us, all those games, but I think because these are real people that are shown, I think it really does deliver kind of a different kind of emotional reaction to people. Yeah, it was it was especially crushing for me to hear about yeah what what uh, was going to happen with Samuel when he was a kid and or when he was an adult and make you know become 
some sort of children's author or something. It's it does remind you of the erasure of possibilities, which is what death and like un- murder and genocide, obviously, that's all about is like what could have been and the endless butterfly effect that comes from people not existing in the world and not putting their own effect into the world for it to affect others. It's deep. The ending is deep. It's stark. And I think it's wonderfully done. And um, I want to congratulate you on a, on, a, on a project well done. But I also wanted to ask you a little bit, if I might, about the creation of it. Um, how did you... The game's free, which I think is awesome. So how did you get... Did you have to do something or like kind of get an exception to get put on PlayStation Network and on Steam and all these kinds of things? And I noticed that you use Unreal Engine, but that I think you ain't thank Epic in the credits. So I assume they gave you a license to use it for free and things like this. Did you did you find people to kind of collaborate with you on this project? And I'm curious about the funding of it and all this. So ba- basically, why we launched it first on the Epic Game Store. So since it's released for free, pretty much Epic only take money off of paid projects and Epic. Once I showed it to them, they were kind of like the first people to be super encouraging of it, where they were kind of like, this is important. This is, we love this project. Um, pretty much they went into how, how they've, they knew they've gone to Holocaust museums. Like they're super passionate about it, they were. While it was kind of harder with other platforms where... Um, in the case with PlayStation, where I managed to get it out for free, I did. I it's only until since launch that PlayStation had, you know, the, the marketing department had kind of banned it from launching on a marketing channels they had. There's a bit of an internal tuffle uh, within, within Sony where I had the account managers who were like, "This is important. This is actually an important video game." who were helping us get dev kits, all things like that, pretty much super supportive. But then you had the marketing team who were pretty much like, no, we want, we don't want to promote this even on our YouTube channel. Why, and why is that? So I was never able to get an, an official response. Um, I wasn't pretty much. I don't know what it could be. It could be... You know, it's a video game about the Holocaust, so some people assume it could be terrible, and that I kind of get, but I, you know, it's kind of this completely different department it is, pretty much. It's so strange, dude, because you think that that's something like this, with the, the level of their operation, how much money they churn, all of the projects going on, all the things you have to keep in mind, you would think you would see something like this come along from someone like you, who I know from my own experience in the world of PlayStation has worked with PlayStation on things before. I've met you at events in the past to show games off and all the rest. So they know who you are. You would think that this kind of thing would be like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. Bye. And then you would go on to your other business, you know, like, yeah, okay. Publish your game. We'll put you on YouTube. We'll give you a PlayStation blog post, whatever. Just let us know when you're ready. And then you yeah. worry about something else. Like I, that's so stupid. You know, I couldn't get anything. And the account managers were for it that they were behind us pretty much even they were kind of baffled and even at some point i think for the youtube one account manager had to kind of go in and talk to them where he was because it was you know getting so ridiculous like literally years it was and that's why i haven't released a, a trail on it yet because i just kind of gave up but then we seen an account manager like a couple one or two months ago i forgot he pretty much went and talked to the marketing team i don't know what he said but then after he's like yeah submit it now because and what was fascinating too, also within kind of the, the industry. So I had so basically the Latino account managers everywhere, fucking awesome, pretty much. They were like, "We get it. This is important." I don't want to make this about identity politics, anything like that. But kind of the, the white people, and again, I don't like using that term. Were kind of like, eh, "Don't know about this. It's too much a white story." No, you don't count as part of our diversity thing. Like we even tried applying to diversity grants because I was kind of like, listen, my entire team, apart from me and Dimitri, pretty much who have fairer skin, entire team is what you would consider, you know, diversity. Like we're actually more diverse than any other American team. And we're just, we're doing something about the Holocaust, pretty much never done in video games. Support in human tragedy, 
And the responses were, no, nah, we're not doing things about white people right now. No, nah, it doesn't really count as part of our diversity thing. So I was getting all these things when we were trying to get help for funding. So got zero in funding, <laughs> pretty much. I self-financed it myself. Wow. I did pretty much uh, launched it, put my money where my mouth is at. But it, it really did kind of open That's amazing, up. amazing, dude. Open up because because even even what I'm noticing too like like again the video game press hasn't cared much from it apart from Ryan over IGN you know I can't it's believe that <laughs> I well, can't do, believe they don't care yeah yeah and it's kind of like so I'm hanging from the mainstream press the mainstream press basically be like this can change video games like video games could look towards this, towards addressing other important topics. This is important. Video game press doesn't give a shit about it. And and that is what has just been so fascinating with this whole endeavor is that the gaming industry hasn't really cared about it that much. The mainstream has eaten it up. Uh, they have. It's been uh, successful. And apart from Epic Games, who are really on board, pretty much the most supportive right away, you know, it hasn't. We haven't really received the uh, the kind of support, you know, from other manufacturers, things like that. And again, I um, I love Sony, and thank God we're able to launch it for free on their platform. But it is it's a very interesting thing. How come uh, Sony? And I'm nothing against because I think we should make games for all kinds of things, but how Sony part of their diversity thing is very much like look to our games with weird furry animals, pretty much. That's part of our diversity thing. But something about a literal genocide and oppression and what Nazi Germany really was. Oh no, we can't show that. But yet you have all these World War II games. I mean, right, exactly. Just, they'll farm them for games. They, yeah. they, they're farmed for games, and they won't be accurate. They won't show everything. Like they, there'd be a huge distortion. They, they will literally make money off the dead. They will. They will not present a Jewish character. Like, and yet you show the reality. It's like, oh no, that's 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 too much, man. And that's why it's been fascinating because human rights groups have started looking at this game being like we can actually this can actually show empathy this can actually maybe change society we've had like european center for populism studies that thinks pretty much they're like this video game could actually make people pro-refugee we've had people in africa reach out to us and be like i see myself in these characters and that's one fascinating thing is that it's people from all over the world at different ethnicities colors this and that who see themselves in these characters who really care about this. And that's what's really opened up opened up my, my eyes, really, is that I believe since we've told a human story, focus on the empathy that everyone can relate to these characters, no matter where they're from, what continent, this and that. And I think that's really what connects us the most. And that's why I'm, I mean, I was even in Switzerland uh, in April pretty much, um, with a bunch of also uh, black people doing panels on anti-racism, doing on all these things. So everyone, kind of the anti-racist space, everyone has all opened it up. But the gaming industry, of course not everyone, because again, Epic were fantastic. Mm. We're just like, this is a white thing. And I'm just kind of like, wow, you know nothing about Nazi Germany or the Holocaust. And I think, and that's why I honestly believe that you know, the same people that kind of, quote, unquote, you know, didn't do things right in terms of how you need to be getting more different developers of different countries, you know, more uh, games and this and that, are still the people in charge and kind of still don't know, I think, what they're doing. I don't honestly, because again, when we have like one of the most diverse teams, we didn't qualify for anything. Uh, and now the reception of it, I'm just kind of like, this is kind of, madness and and i think it's also because i very much was always like it has to be free too so i've refused to also um kind of you know you don't want to monetize the holocaust I, I, as or yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to monetize it so it really is to me it's one of the purest kind of forms of 
art it is and i think it's something which the gaming industry should have been more supportive of because now because of this game now there's holocaust organizations which are putting funding towards video games we have actually really changed the space we have and it's first time a game about the holocaust is actually being even addressed i mean we're going to try to i highly doubt it's going to happen we're going to try to like get nominated somehow for the game awards you know because they have a games for social change yeah, they yeah. do but i have zero hope it will be nominated because i'm just kind of like it doesn't fit into the gaming industry's kind of trends and this and that who knows very much i have no idea how it works because again when i saw the one that won last year the games for social change um i was kind of like this is not really a game for social change this isn't and so well we'll rally to your banner when the time comes let us know how we can help you know if it's like a fan vote or something like that i'm sure we can we but, can get something then, going for you there's also another interesting thing is that as you remember when you play the game and once the credits roll in at the end you know i basically decide to thank thank ralph bayer mm -hmm. i saw that and ralph bayer created what can be considered you know video games today mm -hmm. and his family had to leave Nazi Germany. So it's even how can I say, because even when I brought it up to like big manufacturers, right? When they were kind of like not wanting to promote it, or just give me a YouTube. I was like, listen, this is literally a Jewish creation by a guy who family had to flee. This is, I mean, this is why the Holocaust has to be addressed in video games. This is why this is important. Like it's part of our history, man. Like let us tell our story. And that's what again was so, very fascinating. With yeah, that's song. so interesting because you would think that would be a very effective deck, right? If you opened up and said, this is Ralph Baer. Ralph Baer's parents escaped Europe during the Holocaust. If that didn't happen, we would have never gotten video games. We would have never gotten this story and so on and so forth, segueing into that. But I can understand. I mean, this is where intersectionality really kind of craters in on itself because you're just too white and you're too – like Jews are just too white adjacent. I think to get the that level of diversity respect on the intersectional ladder, you know, it's just not it's not happening. I mean, that's it's sad to hear because and I had dude, I had no idea you self financed the game. I mean, that's that's a uh, that really is putting your money where your mouth is, and I think that that's absolutely amazing. And I'm sorry that you haven't gotten more games press, although you're at like the unholy trinity, like the nexus of free, short, and controversial, potentially controversial. So. There, I think a lot of people would look at maybe critical or review coverage as needless because you're not paying any money and it's not costing you much time. You just need the coverage of awareness, you know, and I hope that that's what our podcast brings to, to the fore. Like it, it only requires an hour of your time. And I think that that's so powerful. So I'm glad that it's fine. It's found success for you, even though you've had some obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause I mean, the mainstream press, it's been like the big mainstream press in France. It was like, all the national news channels. So th we are good when it comes to press. I just thought it was interesting that the gaming uh, press was kind of like not interested in it. And I don't, I don't know what quite, quite. What I could have is. told you that though, before you even <laughs> released it, I could have told you they weren't going to be interested in it because it's not, it's not telling the kinds of stories they want to tell. And I'm, I mean, it's just, that is just, we all know that, right. That there's certain, the, the 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 term diversity and the common nomenclature just means certain things now and it it doesn't mean it doesn't mean true diversity as in everything so uh so i think you f fell prey to that so uh, but i'm glad you got and, and you don't games press games press is mostly useless anyway it's uh the mainstream yeah, press will be much it, more helpful for you yeah it, it was better to get the mainstream press uh mm -hmm. honestly too but but also kind of your point about diversity i mean we have Bernard, who's kind of like one of them. He's Sephardic. He's from Algeria, and it's interesting how he didn't count. It was just interesting, and, and I think it really, if if anything, I mean, we've we've been fine, kind of without in it, and it's kind of why I have uh, started to distance myself, kind of more and more from the gaming industry, because I think I think we're growing. I think our industry is great, but I don't think we're kind of getting stagnant and stuck again we are because again it's it's not you know we're not really pushing for true creativity and kind of new video games to be told and kind of things like that but 
again, what's fascinating, I've met also a lot of other game developers who've been become inspired by this game to tell more other serious games and other game developers which have made games about refugees, things like that. So it's found its space kind of more like in the human rights community it has, which arguably is more important than the the gaming industry heads of diversity who, you know, who don't really know what true diversity and, and fighting for human rights looks like. Yeah, fair enough, man. Well said. And I, my last question for you before we go is, are you going to continue to do these kinds of more educational projects or do you want to get back into obviously the paid space? I'm sure you're probably in need of capital uh, after oh, funding this game yourself. <laughs> definitely um, could have bought a house. <laughs> So um, I think that that's really awesome that you did that. And that's like a true sign of putting your money where your mouth is. But I'm wondering what's next for you. So I I think I might have a couple uh, next projects about the Holocaust, uh, pretty much. These are things which are basically based off real people. So I have that. I do. That's kind of... That's a couple ways from now because now there has been like actually organizations that want to work with me, give us funding, things like that. Awesome. So Excellent. I'm preparing for the next kind of multi-million dollar project. I am pretty much where it's going to be big. Light in the Darkness, I saw it as something which is for all ages, pretty much, very much like that. On my next project, I would say more, it starts at young adults. It does. So it's going to be definitely not something I'd recommend for kids, more like something like kind of like, not like Shinders this, but more kind of on that kind of scale, pretty much more realistic, all those things. But that's like a couple of years are out. There also has an interesting cool thing which has happened is that uh, I started like advising at some museums, Holocaust museums. So they're looking now at what I brought. Maybe this is the way how we, you know, manage to get people to empathize pretty much this way of storytelling. Definitely. So, so that's changed lots of things. The anti-hate space has also started looking at what, we, what we've done, some advising kind of on how to combat hate and even giving like um, being September with government, things like that, you know, how the video game, game space can work, this and that. Because I, I believe... Um, Pretty much the way the ADL went about with Fortnite was wrong, pretty much, when they straight up said that Fortnite was worse than Twitter. And I was like, you've lost your mind. <laughs> you have, like, because they found a couple of usernames and right. you, could, you couldn't... You couldn't reach Epic to get them banned. Yes, it was hard, pretty much. But honestly, I understand Epic. Epic is kind of like, well, listen, it's a couple of usernames where it says Hollow Hoax. You didn't have people around Fortnite literally doing Sig Howls and like, you know, those things or denying the Holocaust. So this is kind of like on our low priority list. I'm not saying they said that, but I kind of get it why. There's not a Nazi problem within Fortnite. <laughs> there isn't. Right. And so when they went ahead and publicly blasted them, this and that, I was like, this is so wrong. What you should have done is you go to game developers, you tell them, Listen, I think there's some white supremacy within your communities, which which is the case. I mean, it, it's not it's not like every community because I want because I love the gaming industry, and so pretty much, I'm more where I think you should instead build a manual for like community managers where they can spot code words, spot all the white supremacist stuff to give them the tools to be able to know. So I don't believe, funny enough, in. Uh, quote unquote coming in and policing the gaming industry. I don't. I believe instead helping the gaming industry. And that's where I think I have a very different approach than some of these big organizations. Cause I think they're doing more damage than good. Because I, I do again believe I do think yes we have problems. There is extremists that use video games. But our industry as a whole has brought more people together and I think is a better kind of industry. I mean, that's why, you know, doing Delight and Darkness via video game was so important. I think we should be putting more of these things out very much, things like that. So it's it's not by censuring everything or policing everything, you're going to kind of reduce hate. It isn't. So, but that thankfully, 
lot of big anti-hate organizations are like, and governments are paying attention to this now to do it the right way. So it's kind of cool how everything is kind of like very much changed. It, it had all changing. So I do have a lot of, uh, and there is, I, I think, going to be more video games now about the Holocaust. I think we've opened up those doors. And that's why, again, um, you know, in the Economist articles, they're kind of like, you know, this can open up a door for people who want to do stories about the Armenian genocide or other things mm -hmm. or Rwanda. Like, so I, I think, I think overall it's good. I think we're going to see the game industry also be able to be taken more seriously in terms of, you know, addressing things like the Holocaust. And kind of funny enough, my dream, if I had a dream, would be for Naughty Dog to do a video game about the Holocaust because I'd just be like, you guys have the budget, you know, great storytelling. Yeah, two hundred million dollar game about the Holocaust. That would be very interesting. I mean, <laughs> I don't think it will make any money. But <laughs> well, it's funny as you, I don't know about that. It's like it's as you are talking about these things. I, it's obviously very easy to take it literally and say, well, we need these educational, very front facing games that really teach a lesson. But it's like there could be a whole subculture of even fiction told in in hot, the time of the Holocaust and World War II that has, that's detached from the military realities and much more focused on the personal realities of the people that are being affected by the actual conflict, which is much rarer. You know, It's fun to walk around and shoot things, but it's also interesting to think about how people live during those times. So it's cool to hear that that will continue. And I hope that when your next game's announced, you come to the show and talk, talk about it because I'll be interested to ask you all about it. Yeah, that will be... It's a few years off, basically, from now, but... I mean, that's also what I'm encouraging people. Like, again, I love the Wolfenstein games. Uh, mm. I actually wish that they would address the Holocaust more. I actually wish that they were straight up like the Nazis succeeded in Europe. So, but again, the problem has been a lot of these gaming companies, they're scared to address it because any second you might have the ADL pop up and be like, you can't do this. We're going to go after you. You're anti-Semites, things like that. So that's, and I think, Light and Darkness has broken that, where now, you know, organizations who know nothing about video games can't go after developers anymore. And I think that is very important because, again, you know, games are art and people should be able to explore different topics. The intent matters, you know, even if, even if your game releases and it sucks, as long as you have the intent, I, I think we should be open towards developers doing these things. Well... Let's wrap up. I want to know where people can find more information about the game, the light in the darkness. I will say you probably know this. I try. You have a donate button on the the splash page, but it is broken on PlayStation right now. That's my fault because I've got to update all the like um, <laughs> all the metadata, all things. Like that, and I've just been so busy, so that's literally been my fault. Okay, Which I just wanted to let you know because I'll I'll happily donate when the time when when that patch when that's patched i guess so people can support it that way but how can people find more about the game i really do encourage people by the way the audience you, there's so many of you out there this is a game it's spend an hour with it there's no nothing but an hour of your time and, and they I get really a platinum you, trophy oh yeah and the platinum the, it's a, that's true it's an unavoidable platinum um if you beat it as well which is huge so that's actually very smart but uh yeah i, I just highly recommend it I, I really doubt that you'll feel like you wasted your hour when you're done and that's all it asks so check it out but um where can people find more basically go to a playstation 5 store uh psn or the epic game store which is where it's exclusive on pc and uh we're working on the ps4 port we are right now so ps4 will come later it will but so right now playstation 5 and the epic game store awesome um the light in the darkness please check it out uh luke thank you for your time appreciate you good to see you congratulations on your success Thank and, you. And uh, thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things Last Stand. As always, we appreciate you. We'll see you next time for more. Until then, goodbye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. 
As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.